This is Smashing Prohibition's Objective 3 about how prohibitions ended in the arts, and just like in other aspects of society where various boundaries were broken, uh, traditional boundaries were broken, uh, that also happened in the arts as well, specifically in the rise of African American culture uh, known as the Harlem Renaissance, or the rebirth of Harlem. Now, uh, this is primarily the result of uh, African Americans bringing jazz and blues with them from the New Orleans region and other southern cities to uh, New York. And uh, with the speakeasies that were happening at that time, this is really a perfect fit. Um, Harlem clubs and African American jazz clubs during this particular time uh, welcome in, you might want to jot this on the side, uh, welcome in people from Europe, from all sorts of other foreign nations, uh, all parts of America, including a lot of them who were white. They just came to enjoy the music. Now, the most famous, if we're taking a look at all these different things in uh, um, uh, letter A here, uh, the most famous one was the, the Cotton Club in Harlem. And Harlem today, of course, is a little more downtrodden, uh, but back then it was the most famous spot in America for jazz and blues. And uh, the Cotton Club reflected re reflected that idea. It was a, a club is a high status place. So the Cotton Club was the idea that they had left the cotton fields and were now in the Cotton Club. And because of that, Harlem becomes a cultural center of jazz uh, and in some aspects blues music for people all over the world. But Harlem, New York is uh, uh, although it's the core of of jazz and the Harlem Renaissance. It becomes um, more than just jazz. The Harlem Renaissance is a, a revival of, uh, of African-American spirit, of African-American art, uh, pride in being uh, the new Negro, as you can see in this sign right here. Here's a rally in Harlem, and it says, The new Negro has no fear. Well, because of this, and, and the 100,000 African-American residents living in Harlem in the 1920s, America starts to see a Harlem revival and therefore a revival in what it means to be an African American, a new pride in what it means to be an African American. Now again, if you take a look at A4, uh, the leaders of this revival are in the arts, okay, starting with various musicians like Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, who is most famous today for uh, uh, what a Wonderful World and other things that we know. Uh, Armstrong was a generational musician who came about in the 20s but was just as popular in the 1950s uh, and 60s as he is, and, he, and he's still popular today as he was in the 1920s. Uh, Bessie Smith, W.C. Handy, Jelly Roll Morton, King Oliver and his famous Creole band, probably one of the most famous big band acts, if you want to call it a big band, but one of the most famous acts of the uh, Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. And U.B. Blake. Uh, these were just some of the people that were bringing African-American jazz to Harlem and making it uh, famous worldwide. Writers were a part of this as well, such as uh, Zoll Neal Hurston, and the famous poet Langston Hughes. Politicians like Marcus Garvey also signified the power of the quote-unquote New Negro. Uh, he founded the United Negro Improvement Association, and his particular aim was just to say, we're going to come up with the funds to resettle uh, African Americans back in Africa uh, to show pride in being African. Marcus Garvey was a very inspirational leader at that time, and and uh, basically he convinced African Americans to demonstrate racial pride and self-confidence. However, uh, he did have uh, a little bit of corruption uh, involved in his uh, career. Most of his businesses uh, failed, and he was eventually deported for mail fraud. Uh, but well into the 60s, and this is something that should be jotted down on the side here, people like Malcolm X uh, and the Black Panthers, well into the 1960s, often referred back to Marcus Garvey and the inspirations that he had given them. Another aspect of the arts that was a, a major revolution of the 1920s was the radio. We had talked about this before 
with the American economy, uh, primarily because prior to 1920, ham radio systems were the most prevalent part. But KDKA out of Pittsburgh uh, broadcast election results from a rooftop in 1920, and then scenes like this one here became much more common. Uh, radios were now using, uh, uh, are being used to transmit a national message. With the radio being rasp, or <laughs> with the radio being mass produced, it could now be sold at a less expensive price to a mass audience. And now people of all races and colors and genders were all sitting around and listening to the exact same shows and the same news broadcasts. Uh, this should be jotted on the side of, of uh, B two uh, B here. Uh, you'd never really seen that before. Uh, most people. When it came to uh, their entertainment, they kind of stuck to their own cultural and local things. The radio changes all that. By this time, uh, now that everybody's listening to the same thing, it's easy for newscasters and politicians to become known across the nation. Sometimes you voted for people without ever hearing them speak. Well, that wasn't the case anymore. And here's an interesting one as far as uh, B2, B2, uh, soap companies started targeting housewives uh, and young women. Uh, their melodramas in the middle of the day were advertised by uh, soap companies, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, in trying to sell women these, these household products, the modern-day soap opera, as we know it, was born. By the late 1920s, people were even starting to work on televisions, uh, although they would not be mass marketed until the 1950s. As you can see here, uh, this is a TV. It's not a radio, it's a TV, and the screen is uh, extremely small. It was kind of like looking through a peephole. They wanted to do something a little better before they mass marketed it, and then the Great Depression and World War II got in the way. Uh, TVs would not be mass marketed until the 1950s after they were improved on. Uh, but that's worth noting on the side, is that TVs were actually invented in the late 20s, just not able to be mass-marketed because of the Depression and the war and those distractions that people had to concentrate on because they were a little more important at the time. In the meantime, radio and film were the dominant forms of entertainment. And If you take a look at letter C here, uh, we're going to get into the Hollywood aspect of things. Um, silent motion pictures like the Great Train Robbery, had been very popular ever since 1903. Even though the Great Train Robbery was a, uh, a Western that was filmed in New Jersey, of all places. That might be worth noting down on the side. Other silent films like uh, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation about post-Civil War South became immensely popular as well in 1915. And even though the action scenes were pretty good, they still hadn't tapped into um, what Hollywood could truly be. But you also have to remember that Hollywood, back in those days, was just kind of a, a dusty little town uh, during the silent film times. Uh, once uh, films became more and more popular, though, this dusty little town turned into a major movie capital. Uh, Hollywood... Uh, was used because there were so many natural sets that you didn't have to pay for, like oceans, lakes, forests, mountains, and deserts. And as a result, uh, this little town started to grow a little bit. As you can see here, way in the background, back then it was called Hollywood Land. Uh, eventually they would take the last four letters off and it would just be Hollywood. That was actually on a previous slide as well. The fact that it was called Hollywood Land might be something else worth noting down. By, you get, by the time you get to the late 1920s, movie stars uh, are getting high salaries and becoming more well-known across the country, in some cases, than government leaders are. People such as this guy, uh, you may not recognize him the way he looks right here, uh, but this is Charlie Chaplin. You probably know him more by looking like this. But one of the most noteworthy things that happens, and you look at this under C4, is the first talking film, or the first talkie. Uh, you will want to know this for the AP U.S. History test. It's fairly commonly on it. Uh, the Jazz Singer in 1927, uh, which was one of the most famous films of American history, 
in part because it was the first speaking film. But it was also pretty interesting because it had, on a national scale, a white man wearing blackface playing a black man. Uh, Al Jolson was uh, wearing his blackface was an artistic form that had been in theaters before, but it did strike me and still strikes people kind of odd that they wouldn't just let a black man play a black man. But some of the greatest revolutions in the arts in this time may have been in the aspect of literature. Specifically, if you take a look at letter D here, The Lost Generation, which uh, uh, was centered around Greenwich Village, New York, which is still a very liberal and artistic area today. Um, the Lost Generation was mostly about, uh, about the young and uh, the resentment of failed ideas after World War I. Uh, them saying all the things that they had believed in were not necessarily so. And there were a lot of famous authors that you've probably heard about in your English classes. If you take a look down the list on uh, letter D there, H.L. Uh, Mencken um, basically attacks anything that was remotely conservative. I'm sure you've heard of F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, uh, with uh, specifically The Great Gatsby in 1925. This is he and his wife Zelda who had a very tumultuous marriage an author from the progressive era uh, named Theodore Dreeser. Uh, he had written some books early on regarding American business and uh, it basically stopped writing in 1915. In 1925, he comes back with an American tragedy. Ernest Hemingway, who had World War I experiences and wrote about uh, those experiences in The Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms, he would also later carry his craft well into the 1950s uh, with things like The Old Man and the Sea and uh, different books like that. Uh, by 1960, he would eventually take his life, uh, or by the 1960s, he would take his life with a shotgun blast. But these writers collectively at this time in the 1920s were known as the Lost Generation writers. Uh, and they basically looked at uh, society and just said that we were in a fog, that we were uh, not who we were supposed to be, and they didn't really know what to do. Uh, but a lot of these writers were inspired by somebody named Gertrude Stein. You can see here on the right, her here on the right, and uh, she had a salon in Paris where a lot of lost generation writers would gather and write novels that inspired them, similar to the ones she had written. Many other writers also uh, were inspired by this time period. William Faulkner, who wrote about the American South in most of his uh, uh, books. Ezra Pound. And T.S. Eliot, uh, both of whom had left America to go live in Europe and then reflect on what was happening in America while they were over there. The poet Robert Frost. and E.E. E. Cummings, uh, both of whom were people, again, all these people are probably uh, authors and poets that come up in your English classes fairly often. And one other artistic style that kind of smashed prohibitions uh, during this time, if you look down at letter E, architecture, led by Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright believed in a more modern style, not the Victorian homes of the 1800s with all their ornate architecture and things like that. Um, Wright's architecture dealt more with uh, uh, buildings growing from their natural sites using the materials around them as part of the architecture. Here's uh, one of his most famous examples here. And also uh, a museum. A uh, house in Arizona that was uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. You can see it kind of blends into its natural surroundings and a house in Arizona that he had built for his son. So, in various aspects, in various ways, the arts are also a type of smashing prohibitions in the 1920s. Thanks for listening.